lugu peetud kokku tulnud. Ära Eesti vabariga president. Kolleegid ja kõik teised õiges protokolli. President of the Republic of Estonia, colleagues and everybody else according to the rules of protocol. According to the guidance provided to me regarding my greeting, I will contemplate aloud what is this information. According to the explanatory dictionary of Estonian, it is false, misleading information. It's misinformation. Where I came from, and this used to be called and is still called simply a lie. But yes, this information is a certain type. Moreover, a lie that is presented in a certain situation in a certain manner. An intentional lie presented or spread in someone's interests or to achieve something specific. When we use euphemisms instead of a lie, does it make it less of a lie? Well, I don't know, rather not. So for now, I would take the generalization that this information is a certain type of lie. It's still a lie. I believe that lies and disinformation are as old as humanity presenting bait to a fish which used to be made out of willow bark and now out of tin is natural, authentic disinformation and there are millions of pieces of disinformation uh, that have been presented uh, over these long years. For example, the Trojan horse and the ideology that came with the Russian occupation that plagued Estonians and other nations. Abraham Lincoln uh, is said to have stated that you can fool some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. So this information has its limits. Though a colleague of Lincoln's from the 21st century brought about uh, expressions like alternative facts and post-truth era, these expressions are disinformation, as if there could be alternative facts. Another linguistic form, facts excluding facts, that's nonsense. The next part of the conference is titled Disinformation between conscious falsehood and unintentional deficiency of truth. This short phrase contains a number of disinformation based or misleading bits. But in order to discover and unravel these and others similar to it is what we're going to be focusing on today. So I'm going to untangle myself from this mishmash with a loan from the world of fairy tales. Pinocchio, how do you know that I lied? The teacher, there are lies that have short legs and lies that have long noses. Your lie, as it happens, has a long nose. Best of luck for the conference. Before I pass the floor to the participants of the first panel, I would like to say by way of explanation, uh, at issues conference, we're using uh, Kurov, Kurov's Russian director's uh, movie design. This movie was made in 2022, and as all good movies in Russia, it was banned. It's a fantasy movie where in the 20th century, four of the biggest heroes are anti-heroes, uh, Stalin, Hitler, Churchill and Mussolini uh, act. They meet in the world beyond where they are expecting to be met by God. Sakurov's fairy tale is a story about how these characters haven't learned anything from history. It continues to plague them. So this is visually very imposing. In addition to carrying a message, this is a form of art. Sakurov has taken the characters to Dante's divine comedy world. And I'd like to say that starting from today, 
for 10 days. You can watch this movie on the webpage of the Institute only for 10 days. We have permission from the producer. It is subtitled in English, but otherwise English, German, Italian, and Russian are used, or Georgian are used in the movie. But now I'd like to pass the floor to Neme. The conference will take place in Estonian and we have interpretation into English. So panels might be a bit complicated with two working languages, but we'll cope. Technology allows us, as you could see, uh, to bring people back to life and put words in their uh, Miles, the recent strike in uh, and demonstrations in Hollywood also covered this topic, and uh, so we are now going to be uh, speaking about uh, these very topic: disinformation between uh, conscious falsehood and intentional deficiency truth. And uh, now I'm going to ask the speakers to take a stage: Elina Shnurka Dabakova, opinion leader and public speaker from Ukraine. You see, Han Himanke is a professor of uh, international history and politics who will join us from Geneva. Uh, from uh, HEID and an author of a number of publications on international relations, Daniel Brown, head of cabinet of Ms. Vera Jourova, vice president of the European Commission for Values and Transparency. And uh, head of reviewing uh, the misinformation guidelines as well. And uh, Sim Kumpats, Policy Officer, Division Strategic Communication Task Force and Information Analysis eStratcom Task Force. Siim, please take the floor. And on Arnold Sinisalo, a lawyer, uh, he was the uh, director general of uh, the defense police in Estonia, and uh, he has worked on international law. Before I pass the floor to the panelists for their opening uh, introductory statements, let's speak briefly about disinformation. Minister Lan had already explained the definition of misinformation. This has been discussed widely. We all know this, especially during COVID. I remember at this conference, we also had a panel discussion on what to believe and what not to believe, but technology advances very quickly. Just two years ago, at this conference, we uh, did not speak about AI at all that entered our lives uh, over recent years, artificial intelligence that makes information wars even more complicated. And another character that uh, Estonia might have to tackle very directly, Donald Trump, who might again become the president of the United States, who started in politics uh, by uh, just labeling the news that he didn't like as false news, and then the media had to explain that it's not false. And uh, this might uh, become prevalent again when he re-enters uh, politics. Uh, President Putin as well uses uh, uh, media very uh, connivingly. And another reference to a uh, source. In the framework of this conference, so we should uh, think of the main document that, that 76 years ago was adopted, uh, the General Declaration on Human Rights, Article 19, that uh, covers specifically disinformation, uh, well, indirectly, actually, uh, because uh, in that era, the main tool of information that spread across borders was the radio. Now it's the internet and all the new tools. And uh, for that reason, the, uh, this article says that people have the right of conviction and expression, free con expression of their convictions, and to also uh, 
that spread their own information across borders and to receive information. So they don't mention disinformation uh, directly. How do we interpret it now, 76 years later? And um, President Putin's interview with Tucker Carlson, uh, right wing uh, commentator from the US, uh, how should we take this interview? Uh, Congress has uh, not approved the aid to Ukraine. It's being delayed. Uh, Tucker Carson uh, was he too, a tool, a useful idiot for the Russian regime, or he said that, that uh, he, he was just a journalist who got the interview that everybody else was after. It was a two-hour interview. I watched it in the morning. It's very similar to Putin's interview two years ago at the beginning of the war. But what's interesting is that the EU already uh, started responding to uh, this uh, because in uh, the EU we have the Digital Services Act uh, that regulates technology companies like Elon Musk's X uh, that uh, also um, broadcast the interview, uh, demanding that uh, companies' algorithms uh, must uh, prevent falsehoods from being spread. And this was also um, mentioned at uh, European Commission press conference yesterday. Uh, the representative said that the information war is underway and uh, what uh, will be done about Musk's ex uh, was uh, left open. But let's start with the introductions and statements of the panelists first. Elena, I would like to pass the floor to you. Invitation to this event, of course, thank you very much to Estonia for help and cooperation, which we have last two years, more, more soon. And I would like that, uh, to, to start from um, idea that disinformation did not start uh, during this uh, war when Russian aggression started to be so hot against Ukraine. It started in the 19th, and I think that it's a very flexible way from Soviet Union to new uh, government organizations of Russia. And of course, they use new technologies, they use uh, new tools, which they have, uh, especially artificial intelligence or uh, IT solutions, but it's nothing new at all. It's Soviet propaganda who use a lot of different levels of influence to population. They just continue. Another question, how new targets of Russian Federation and how um, we have understand this, uh, how we have fight with this, and how we have secure our people from this. Uh, of course, uh, human rights, uh, which uh, for me it's a very specific question because I was uh, more than 10 years in the special committee of uh, Internet Association of Ukraine who carried out against speculation from a state organization who wanted to build Russian system of monitoring for Internet. And they used human rights, yeah, they said the child's uh, in dangerous situation, uh, mafia want to sell them, that's why we need to control internet. And uh, technique, uh, intelligence uh, in Ukraine, especially our association, fights with that. Yeah, because it was real speculation with freedom, with rights to speeches, to get an information. As a result, in Ukraine, we don't have control system how it was built in Russia at the end of the 19th. And maybe it also was helpful to have much more f free, uh, f free society and much more comparative information in Ukrainian mass media market. But uh, now it will be 10 years uh, how Russian aggression started in 14th. Uh, it was, uh, how to say, it was явление зеленых человечков в реальность, it was digital and speeches comes to true, to real true in Crimea in green uh, soldiers, uh, which was not there, of course, uh, and uh, just after a year, a single half year, Putin confirmed that it was Russian army. And now it's two years uh, of hot war, and uh, from my point of view, human rights uh, in area to get in and distribute information of course has cost and very related to the rights to the life. Uh, 
Uh, I never s make speeches if I don't have confirmation for my idea, and that's why I want to uh, show you small slides from researches of my analytical groups. Uh, maybe guys can switch. Yeah, uh, it's a little bit about me. Uh, our topic in uh, Ukrainian information uh, space looks like that. The first graphic, there is mentioned how much uh, per day uh, uh, reminding about fighting with disinformation, and you see there is 10 years history. In the 14th, it was started from very limited, very occasional uh, information about fakes, about uh, influence to uh, news line in our, uh, in our daily uh, life. And the second one, it's about five years uh, remind us about human rights. You see that it's a lot, and just uh, the first peak, it's uh, not war yet, but second one, I think it's already butcher, and uh, it's, just to, it's just to confirm that really we have this in discussion, but these two pictures, I'm first public show them, because it's very fresh research about cybersecurity, and there we calculate how relate uh, uh, how relate um, fighting with disinformation in information space with real rocket uh, bombing of Ukrainian cities. And you see that uh, for people who are good learning math mathematics in school or maybe university, that correlation uh, uh, like 0 0.55 and 0 0.61, it's very high. Coefficient and from mathematics, it means that this topic is very related to each other. Of course, it's not uh, they can survive without each other <laughs> these topics, but if they related in uh, rule of correlation, it means that connections uh, exist and that uh, from uh, human points, it's very easy to understand. Every bombs, every attack from Russia to our cities means that they will provide fakes about. Uh, about army uh, targets, about uh, military objects which they want to buy in just our bad uh, uh, anti-flight uh, system, uh, make this bomb to the uh, peaceful people, to the, our houses, to our villages and schools and uh, hospitals. That's why I'm sure that when we are speaking about rights to information, we have to speak about rights to life, of course, and we have fight for our rights to have speeches and freedom of speeches. And on the other side, yesterday when uh, colleagues asked me about what we should to do it, I said just cooperation between state, between um, between uh, society and between professionals. And I sure that our mass media market have to make rules for themselves, promote these rules to citizens, to population, to secure, uh, to secure professional job in information media. Okay, maybe for the start it's enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let's go now via video to Yushi Hanki Maggi. Uh, in Geneva, I hope we have him online. So welcome. Here I am. Yes. Hello from Tallinn. I can see you there. Thank you. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> so your you. introductory so, um, remarks. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to quickly thank thank you for the invitation first of all, and apologize for not being there in person. It's uh, uh, it's it's a shame. Um, but um, uh, I just want to make maybe a couple of quick points, um, uh, just to start uh, to follow up on what's, what's been said. I do apologize. I'm one of those few Finnish people who cannot understand Estonian. So that's my, uh, I, I haven't quite been able to keep up with everything that's been said so far. So if I repeat something, apologies. Um, I mean, my main point really is about disinformation, um, fake news, all of this. Um, which, uh, which obviously affects all of us on a, on a daily basis, is, is probably to say that it, to, to try to navigate what's new and what's old uh, in terms of where we are. Um, the, there's no question that there's plenty of people out there who believe 
things that seem unimaginable to most of us. Um, some of the statistics about how many people think, still think the Earth is flat, for example, is astounding. Um, um, there's some statistics tell us that about one in six Americans have doubts about the Earth being a ball. 7% uh, of Brazilians seem to believe uh, that the Earth is flat. Uh, now, I'm not going to go on to that theory. Uh, anybody can, of course, in some ways believe what they want, but I think it just shows that, you know, when information gets out there, um, people pick and believe on, on uh, even against fact, they're easily persuaded to think about something that just seems either interesting or makes sense to them for whatever reason um, that they're there. And this, of course, applies to politics, applies to the questions about um, political questions that we deal with every day and, and that we've been talking about already about the, the, the war in Ukraine and, and all the rest of it. There's nothing new about it. Uh, that's the one point that I would underline, first of all. Um, <clears throat> some might say it's actually essential um, that there is disinformation, because otherwise there would be no discussion uh, about things. Um, it is, you know, um, we can find disinformation, the use of propaganda, of course, over, over thousands of years, as much as, uh, you know, we can go back to Caesar and, and, and we can think about uh, various religious beliefs, etc., etc. And, and there is no, um, you know, we can think about various forged documents and, and, and conspiracy theories that have great, great sway in, in the course of history. Um, um, I don't know, one, thing, one, one document often comes to mind is the so-called Protocols of the Elders of Zion that was used in essence to propagate anti-Semitism and ultimately um, uh, is, is in part responsible perhaps for the Holocaust in the 20th century. Now what I would say of course that is new in the 20th and 21st century is the, is the scale and the rapidity with which fake news um, propaganda um, and, and various theories can be distributed and have an impact on how people feel and think about, uh, about various things. The Cold War, <coughs> for example, had a huge um, impact in terms of creating very sophisticated, and it's already alluded to, in terms of, of how the Soviet Union and Soviet and Russian uh, public information agencies perhaps act in, in, in somewhat similar ways. There is a, a great deal of continuity there. Um, Cold War propaganda, of course, was not one-sided. It's important to remember. Uh, and it had a distinguishing feature in the sense that, like most successful um, uses of information or misinformation, there has to be a grain of truth in everything. The pure falseness doesn't usually go very far. There has to be some grain of truth. So the Americans would, of course, paint the picture of godless communism uh, trying to come out and, and take over everybody's lives. The, the fear of totalitarianism and so forth, which have all these religious undertones, etc. Whereas the Soviets would paint the picture of capitalism uh, ruthlessly destroying people's lives, creating poverty. Uh, and, and so forth. And neither of those was 100% correct or false, of course. And that's, I think, what gave the, those, those elements a certain degree of, of credibility and, and allows them to live on beyond uh, the Cold War still. Now, today what we see, of course, is a different kind of environment, media environment, uh, and, and, and so forth. We have, instead of television and newspapers, the social media uh, aspect of, of information spread has taken the concerns and the, the, the discussion about the use of information and, and disinformation in particular to a whole new, new level. Um, Trump, Putin, uh, you know, they're often cited as examples of, of, of policymakers, politicians who misuse uh, the, the information in a, in a rampant way, and, and of course, uh, rightly so. Um, but um, the other side of um, 
of, of, of all of this is to simply to say that that while they um, uh, their their impact is 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 global in a sense that perhaps no other um, uh, that was not possible in the past because of our digital age. Uh, at the same time, their impact often is um, can, uh, is equally countered. The media wars that we see uh, are quite fierce. Um, the, the fact that Donald Trump, for example, lost the election in 2020 kind of shows that, um, that, that we're not in a hopeless, uh, hopeless situation uh, in terms of, uh, of how uh, information in a democracy can still uh, be, um, lead to well, what many of us, can, I guess, would consider somewhat reasonable uh, reasonable outcomes. Will that be a case again this year? I do not know. Uh, and I, I wouldn't be there to, there to go and, and predict. Um, I think uh, ultimately, um, in terms of, um, of, of, of whether one is an optimist or a pessimist about the, um, um, this, this age of, of disinformation and fake news that we're living in, in now. The, the optimist in me would say um, that while it is, of course, extremely disturbing, that lies, half-lies and half-truths can be peddled uh, uh, at an at sort of immense frequency uh, and with, with considerable impact, at the same time, the, the digital age still allows us uh, a great deal of liberty in terms of, uh, of debate, in terms of disagreement. Uh, and that, of course, is the fundamental ingredient in any kind of democratic uh, um, society and, and situation. And, and that's, I guess, what raises the, the question, I think, that the panel is, is to discuss now. Uh, and and in, in terms of what can be done to, at the minimum, sort of limit the worst kinds of abuses of uh, of, of, of this, uh, of, of the, say, the social media um, opportunities. Um, and and uh, I, I think I'll stop there because I think that's where some of the other panelists obviously are much more capable in terms of, uh, of commenting upon that. But happily to have, thank you again for the invitation <laughs> and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Yes, thank you very much and we'll be back with you shortly. But the next speaker, Daniel Brown. European view. Thank Europe you. has a toolbox to fight disinformation. Uh, we do, Mr. President, Minister, everybody, good morning. Pleasure to be here. Um, maybe just to react a little bit sure. before I come to the, to the tools, to, to my uh, um, uh, panelists, co-panelists. Um, I think if you look at where we are, we are indeed in a situation, and this conference is a proof, that disinformation is no longer a niche topic. When I started engaging in this topic a few years ago, it was a niche topic, and I think you, you, you were correct in saying that COVID was a big, big factor there because people saw that it's a real threat that even you can't dissociate offline, online, and it's a threat to people, individuals, and their health, but also to systems, to societies, and, and democratic systems. Um, overall, I, uh, to, to build on the optimistic note a little bit, uh, I do sense an increasing recognition that, and I would go beyond disinformation, uh, it's, it's more generally the erosion of information space, that uh, there's an increasing recognition that this is undermining democracy and that in itself is a security problem. So I think just as in economy, we're moving away a bit from the naivety and we're doing a lot more on economic security. We now also start accepting that we need to have tools and implement them to strengthen and protect democracy and the integrity of elections. I fully agree that uh, disinformation is not new. What is new is the speed and scale. Uh, this is where we get to digital and technology, which also uh, brings the marginal cost of producing disinformation close to zero. Now, as for the instruments that we have, that we rolled out in, in the last few years, in 2020 we 
put forward the European Democracy Action Plan, uh, which addressed the vulnerable uh, aspects of democracy, um, protection of elections, protection of media freedom, and fight against disinformation. I'll focus on this online part also because you have Sim here, mm -hmm. um, and because you mentioned the DSA. So um, maybe I start with the overall approach, uh, uh, and this conference uh, has human rights in its name, and the president referred to it. Um, because often there are arguments that by dealing with disinformation from public authorities, we are censoring. Uh, well, we're not. Uh, every citizen, and in, uh, in the tools I will mention, the approach is that every citizen has the right to post any content online as long as it's lawful. Uh, but entirely another matter is how it's distributed, and that's no longer a fundamental right. That's, to a large extent, a business choice. So that's what the US usually calls freedom of speech, not freedom of reach. Uh, so we're not seeking to control uh, or determine what can or cannot be said or posted. The objective is rather to address the perverse incentives of the current online ecosystem in which harmful content is amplified speedily and cheaply and is monetized at, at a massive scale. So, and this endangers citizens' capacity to make informed choices free of manipulation, something, again, that the president and minister both refer to in much more eloquent ways. So um, we have uh, a cornerstone of our approach, um, which is the Code of Practice on Disinformation, which sets out um, over 40 very concrete uh, commitments in areas like uh, uh, demonetization, um, uh, integrity of services, user empowerment, providing access to data for researchers or improving uh, fact-checking. Uh, the beauty is that um, we have around one table and among the signatories not only the online platforms but also civil society, technology providers and the public, uh, public authorities, which is necessary because such a multi-layered problem requires a multi-layered response. Uh, there's a lot of transparency uh, requirements. Uh, now the platforms have started reporting on what they're doing to preserve the integrity of elections, uh, what they're doing specifically on Ukraine-related disinformation. And the third aspect we have now asked them to focus on is, is generative AI and how they're ahead of the elections uh, uh, addressing the new, new threats. Um, now, it's a very agile tool because that's the benchmarks co-made uh, by the industry as well, uh, but it's supported by hard legislation. I think also the, the period where we could only rely on self-regulation of the industry is, is obviously over. And under the Digital Services Act, uh, and I'm sorry I cannot disclose too many details because these are legal procedures, um, but very, on large plat uh, very large online platforms, including uh, X, uh, are legally obliged to address the risks that are brought by their services and to mitigate them. And this will all be auditable, uh, and there are sanctions and, and ways to, um, to make, um, make the industry comply. Um, another pillar um, in this whole of society approach is the European Digital Media Observatory, which we created to be sort of an umbrella for a multidisciplinary community addressing these information disorders. So it's a community of, of fact-checkers. There is a new European Federation of, of fact-checkers. Uh, and there's also um, researchers coming together and sort of pooling the knowledge uh, because of the transparency provided by the Digital Services Act and by the Code of Practice. There is a lot of data out there that would allow us to understand what is really happening. Uh, and that's important because the limitation of fact-checking is that it only assesses truthfulness of a statement. Uh, but transparency allows the user to control the information diet better, but everybody to understand what is really happening in the information space. Last thing I would mention, and maybe to make a bridge to, to Sim, um, 
we sort of looked at the channels of disinformation and how it's disseminated. The next panel will address a bit the demand side, so how media can create an information space that is more resilient. But of course, and that wasn't the case, I would say, uh, four or five years ago, we can now be very vocal about the fact that there are actors who intentionally flood the information space with harmful and deceptive content. And we have to have measures uh, to not make it free to do that, to, to increase the costs of those malicious actors uh, doing that. So I think my, my main point is that disinformation has many facets. The impacts are on a broad range of actors, so it's, it's really all stakeholders are needed. Uh, and that's also why I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will come back to the Digital Services Act shortly, because today it's interesting what the European Union forces an X to do with this uh, Putin interview. Uh, we can discuss that. Should we react to that or we'll just ignore it? But Seem, what language you'll speak? Estonian, English? I'll start in Estonian. Okay, good. Um, President, Minister, President, guests, I'm happy to be back home. We started the day by speaking about binary um, truth and falsehood opposition. I would like to change the angle maybe. And uh, since I'm working in the external action service right now, then we have quite a specific focus area. We're not interested in disinformation in its entirety, but specifically the um, targeted external um, falsehood uh, and information operations directed at also Eastern Partnership countries and Western Balkans. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we uh, went from this information concept uh, to something else, a different path. With disinformation, the issue is, especially when we see how information manipulation is used by uh, the Russian Federation and China and others, then uh, it boils down uh, to uh, the opposition between uh, truth and falsehood, which in some situations uh, can be uh, measured that uh, one plus uh, one is two and it's two tomorrow as well. But uh, do masks protect from the spread of uh, COVID or not? Uh, well, scientists uh, had one opinion uh, four years ago, and uh, uh, now uh, it's a slightly different opinion. It doesn't mean that they were disinformed, but we just had the level of information that we had at that point in time. So what we've done in the External Action Service is that we have looked at this problem uh, from the point of view of uh, manipulative behavior. What do I mean by this? When we use the analogy of a weapon, then disinformation is a bullet uh, that, in the worst case scenario, will cause harm and hit somebody. Uh, it's the, the visible part, and that's why we are all speaking about the, the uh, last uh, piece of a bigger chain. But uh, with we also have the weapon, we have somebody who pulls the trigger, we have somebody who sold the weapon, etc., etc. It's a, a big ecosystem a process. And when we come back to the information space, then what does it mean? It means that before a bit of disinformation reaches someone, somebody has to um, first come up with it, that, that I have an interest I want to promote. Then this piece of uh, disinformation has to be created to write a, a text, to paint a picture, have a robot do it. Then it must be made public and uh, sp then spread and amplified. And when we speak about uh, this information more broadly, uh, then uh, we try to look at the different behaviors uh, uh, that uh, 
Russia and China use to manipulate uh, our people, to deceive our people, this subversion. The way they use it uh, differs, and sometimes it's about lies, but not always. They could take someone's legitimate opinion or factual statement and pay a random company outside the EU a small sum of money uh, for it to ask 10,000 robot accounts uh, to amplify this opinion. Even if the state, the opinion is true, uh, then uh, it's amplified and uh, manipulation is used to distort information space. So how are we trying to counter it, especially in the external action service uh, looking outside the EU? We have this information, uh, anti-information manipulation toolbox. Very briefly, I'm not going to um, bore you at length, uh, but there are four pillars where all the different uh, replies are categorized. It all starts with situational awareness. We need to understand what is taking place in the information space. What is the uh, uh, the uh, enemy, so to say, doing? Uh, what uh, effect does it have on our society? Uh, we analyze how they behave uh, and what our people think of uh, this uh, adversary behavior, whether it has an impact or not. And to give a practical example of what we're trying to do, uh, from this new point of view, uh, focusing on uh, this broader manipulative behavior, we are building this anal analysis data exchange uh, uh, centers concept. And once we've completed it, it will allow us, together with partners, be it other governments uh, or civic society representatives or technology companies, to exchange information about what we're seeing regarding information manipulation. We can do it much quicker than by reading hundreds of pages of reports. It's just a few clicks of the mouse to uh, send big chunks of data that are machine readable to a partners and also to receive uh, this data. Another big uh, uh, pillar in the toolbox is that when we know what's going on in the information space and the next uh, question is, uh, what next? What are we going to do with this knowledge? And uh, there we're interested in what we can do in order to raise uh, um, the resilience of society. Whatever we do, when it comes to Putin's Russia, uh, we cannot f force this regime to stop using information as um, a weapon. We can raise awareness, we can sanction them, but uh, the only way to protect ourselves is to defend and protect ourselves and not to sort of uh, cut ourselves off from what they're doing because it's not possible. And there are a number of things that we can do and we are doing. I'd like to mention to begin with um, the EU versus disinfo project, which is a web page uh, where you can find the biggest collection of uh, R Russian disinformation examples uh, in the world. More than 16,000 examples, they're being catalog cataloged, archived, uh, uh, so that there's an information trail. The goal is to show clearly that what Russia is doing is no accident. It's not a mistake. It's systemic. They've been doing it for decades, if not longer. And uh, we need to have a common understanding of threats. And you might ask that, okay, you have this database, uh, who will it reach? When we look at the figures, then last year, we reached about 20 million people, which, of course, is a, a small share of the total population in the EU, but it's still a considerable number of people who otherwise uh, would uh, not have the information. Um, we are training uh, representatives of civic society. We go to Eastern Partnership countries. We're working with the governments where possible in countries like Moldova, Ukraine, uh, not in countries like Belarus, but in all the six Eastern Partnership countries, we can provide financial support uh, to representatives of uh, civic society. We can support independent media. We can bring them together, just give them a platform where to discuss. 
except in Belarus, you said. Well, in Belarus, we can still work uh, with uh, uh, journalists and representatives of civic society who are now mostly in exile inside the country. You can do very little. And uh, my colleague Daniel already uh, spoke about the Digital Services Act and uh, other tools. And the first, the third pillar is uh, legislation. This is what the EU is um, is uh, competent, very competent at. And and, uh, we are a diplomatic service, and the fourth big thing we can do is diplomatic efforts and levers, and uh, the sanctions are the most visible example. The EU has uh, sanctioned uh, about uh, a dozen um, um, propaganda outlets in Russia, and plus uh, 50 propagandists who, a couple of years ago, uh, spent their entire uh, work week in order to undermine um, the truth. And at the weekends, they got on the plane and uh, uh, spent a nice weekend by the Mediterranean and came back to the office by Monday. They can't do it anymore. Very interesting to discuss what the toolbox is and how it functions. Aron Sinisalo, in your previous job, you uh, were exposed to disinformation uh, very widely. What are your thoughts? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Mr. President, the organizers, thank you for inviting me. So, first of all, uh, how we exactly we view the situation of disinformation, because disinformation is not something which is a standalone. This is uh, part of the uh, information war or the hybrid war, as we talk about it. We talk about the influencing activities in Estonia. And when it comes to the terminology, then it's, uh, there's quite a bit of an issue there. Uh, so, as a lawyer, I would have to say, that were according to my convictions, as uh, paradoxical it might be, that one of the reasons for a hybrid war is the international law. Why do I say that? There's a quote. So if the, uh, we ignore the rules of the international uh, standards, it's not because they're not binding, uh, but the effort is made in order to hide the facts of violating these norms. This comes uh, from concept of law. So uh, Herbert Hart, uh, so British, uh, one of the most um, uh, famous uh, legal uh, researchers. So when it comes to the uh, violation of uh, norms and uh, faking because UN Charter prohibits the use of force, uh, and if you ignore this and then you invent disinformation, some sort of claims, you uh, fake the reality, if you take on the neighbor country of Russia, who says that they need to protect somebody or liberate someone because there are Nazis or fascists who are um, violating human rights always somewhere. So everything else goes with it. So one of the most recent examples uh, that my uh, colleagues from the security police say that they uh, held uh, three people who were vandalizing the memorial of uh, the Second World War, and these people had a direct connection to the Russian special services. You think that why they need to do something like this? But uh, there is probably a point there because it might ca cause some sort of an issue, a friction in the society, so that there are steps which will be taken by the government, and so these are the things which happen. So why is this situation as it is when it comes to the disinformation, disinformation in the world? Uh, then uh, one thing is that when it comes to information and communication technology, then it uh, develops very fast. There are social networks and the impact of social networks networks uh, means that the importance of uh, mainstream newspapers have uh, decreased. And then uh, everything which has been done or the brain research over last decades means that we can use new manipulative ways in order to impact reaction of people through disinformation. This is also an important aspect we have to take into account. And third, we need to be self-critical and say, and say that 
many parties of the EU member states uh, have not been able to react uh, to the problems. Um, for example, uh, when it comes to uh, fears of people, and this is something I want to discuss, because when it com tums, comes to the mass uh, migration, then it caused fear uh, of strangers. And what was the reaction of the EU? Because on one hand, there was a denial, and at the other uh, hand, we can say that if uh, then becomes uh, prohibition of uh, hate speech. Because um, if you are afraid of the people who are coming from a different cultural space, it's natural uh, in a way. Yes, it is uh, not something which is okay, but uh, people who are afraid, then there's no point of calling them racist because that gives you the opposite result of, of what the desired one. Why do I talk about this? Because the migration situation then over the last years or last decade is something that the Russians have been using very well, uh, sending migrants here, uh, causing uh, the rise of populist movements, and this, uh, the exploitation of fear is very simple um, and it's cheap and it's foolproof. So what the problem here is that when it comes to emotions, then as we know that the emotions uh, make people behave according to their instincts, because so this civilized uh, thin layer disappears, and if in a civil civilized situation, a civ uh, uh, society we have to handle people's instincts, then we're going to get a lot of problems. So this is what we uh, how we describe the situation. Then we can say, okay, this is how it is. But then what happens next? What should we do? Because what the members uh, of the panels have said that regulation of the legal environment is necessary, but we have to take into account that uh, people who have used the wrong identity, you can't always identify them, and blocking them, banning them, we all, uh, always have to deal with the consequences at, at the end. So I believe we need a strategy which will be based on the basic values of the society where everybody has agreed on the human uh, life being sacrosanct and so forth. And uh, I have some ideas here. So I understand that they sound a little bit idealistic because achievement of the objective is a lot more complicated than uh, setting these tasks. But I have four points here. So we need to have uh, uh, opinion leaders of the different walks of life. And what is very important is uh, the role of uh, people people from the fields of culture and researchers who keep uh, the cohesiveness of the society. And when you describe the problems, they could describe the uh, problem very well. Second, how can we achieve that is a lot uh, more complicated. But if you have the mainstream media, uh, then it's we should uh, see a stronger role of the uh, mainstream media. How to strengthen it is uh, one of the newer things is a fact check, which the Estonia media started to do as well. So fact checking should become uh, a lot more attractive and when it comes to various articles and positions then it should uh, like add a stamp of quality there. So whether it is uh, uh, ideological bias or is it a false statement? So I think we can probably find something there and forced to conclude then I still have my own background to consider and I believe that EU security institutions role when it comes to fighting the disinformation should definitely be increased and a separate question is that in a certain country how exactly the security institutions are viewed in a positive or negative light but security institutions have their own specific tasks possibilities and solutions when it comes to uh, detecting people of, uh, spreading disinformation. And to conclude, in the Human Rights Conference, maybe it's a bit of a provocation here, but I have to say that, that um, we have to follow this opinion that only a strong country can guarantee human rights because we can see what happens in Somalia because the state cannot guarantee any rights there whatsoever. So uh, as it's been said that the two strong countries, a threat to human rights seems to be a bit weird. And to conclude, when it comes to the EU uh, case law and legislative uh, 
process, then it should not cause obstacles for security institutions. And this is, the, this is it for me. Thank you. We have 27 minutes left for discussions. Let's talk about the spread of disinformation. And let us come back to the Tucker Carson interview, which in international media has been mentioned a lot. Do we see, uh, uh, we see ghosts behind every door? Is this actually disinformation? And what does the European Union um, do now when it comes to the uh, Elon Musk platform uh, X, where you can view this interview? I would say that uh, Russian dissidents, uh, I can't remember who actually, actually said that, but it's probably true that the moment Putin opens his mouth, he starts lying, and that's all there is to it. So this is a fact we cannot avoid, uh, but the content should be ignored. But is this content is impacting members of the Congress who have to vote over Ukraine uh, aid? This is a political discussion. I think this is all pre-existing, so Putin is just dotting the I. I don't think it's going to be make a difference. But the media doesn't ignore it. No, we don't have ignore. At first, uh, maybe professional media knows that we have reached our target groups. We have decided what is main, what is second, what is third. At the second, we have to be proactive because what it means propaganda from Russia, it a lot of editorial plans. And we can fight with editorial plans like editorial plans. Uh, but we have to be more proactive, more professional, and understand what kind of information need to be explained, what kind have to be uh, deciphered, and what kind uh, have to be on flag that it's not true. You know, different level uh, from different disinformation, manipulation, etc. From my point of view, much more dangerous there is manipulation, not fakes. For example, in Ukraine, uh, <coughs> well, it's uh, a really good, uh, uh, powerful uh, thought sector, so, so social um, projects which make fact checking, control, and form social media, etc. But from point of manipulation, it's much more difficult. Even our state people, official people, uh, can use it, uh, Russian narratives and his uh, speeches. That it's really dangerous, but it's true. Yeah, they fight with Russian speeches. They don't explain Ukrainian background. Uh, that's why uh, we need maybe professionals in media, professionals in uh, uh, politics, and I think the main kind of thing there is education. It's much more... Uh, citizen more educated is much more uh, f fight will have winner and uh, don't lose position in this area. So what can European Union do in a case like X? Now you mentioned very very uh, interestingly the economic aspects that if you go after not the information itself but the distribution and economic aspects then we can do really something to prevent this kind of spread. Yes, maybe uh, because you also mentioned the Digital Services Act. So, so right. to I explain that um, the, the DSA, the, the abbreviation to save time, it, it's not designed and, and it should not be uh, addressing individual cases. It assesses the, the system and whether the platforms have systems in place to be able to mitigate the, the risks. Um, uh, and we will not legislate ourselves out, out of the problem. Uh, I can mention that within the frame of this DSA, the Commission has started an investigation of X, which is quite an advanced stage of, of the procedure, and it's the only platform for now. One of the areas that is being investigated is what we call uh, mitigation of risks relating to civic discourse um, and electoral integrity. I hope that's the right uh, word. So that's disinformation, basically. Um, there are several ways that, that uh, platforms can deal with harmful content. They can demote um, or limit the spread of that. They can label, they can remove the content. Um, but it's up to the platform to what, what we want and what we legally oblige them to do is to apply rules that are in line with EU legislation consistently and speedily. So, so I don't want to pronounce myself on the concrete, uh, concrete solution. I imagine when a fact checker uh, flags to X that uh, it was a bunch of lies, X should 
mm -hmm. in some way uh, deal, deal with this. Uh, but it comes back to my initial point that, especially in a case, this is not a very sophisticated manipulation of information space. I mean, this is probably two hours of, yeah. of lies. Yeah. Uh, and it's difficult to shut down completely president of any state uh, from, from the information space. So there is an important role of, uh, of media, there is an important role of civil society. Uh, to structure the information space uh, in, a, in a better way, to allow people to f form opinions. And there's a role for political communication. I think, uh, uh, coming back to your initial reference to, to economic security, mm -hmm. when we are explicit uh, about, uh, I don't know, a big country uh, using economic coercion on a neighboring country here, uh, we should not be afraid to publicly respond through strategic communication or sort of attribution of lies uh, from, from also official levels. At the same time, I think it's not always the case and not always the best way for the authorities and for governments to, to start responding and correcting lies. That's why I think it needs to be a whole ecosystem supported by, by the media and civil society and by the legislation that rebalances the responsibilities in the online space and obliges the platforms to do a bit of a cleaning service there. Jim. So maybe a few points, because um, I uh, agree with what Arnold says, because we have to be more confident and we should not uh, get so stressed out uh, over everything. I would be concerned if we ended up here uh, because there was a respected BBC uh, Oh, legitim, uh, a legitimate media uh, journalist, but this uh, it's not it's just Tucker Carlson because he's definitely not legitimate. But leaving aside this single case, uh, what can we do? Is that we need to educate people so they would understand what is happening in this kind of situation, so they would understand it was not actually a journalist who was interviewing a democratic head of state, but this was something else. But if this journalist is most viewed political journalist in the United States, it's not, well, BBC journalists could be very respectable, but doesn't have the mil millions of people watching him, uh, watching them. Well, this is the reality where we are today. So there are two questions there. One, should Tucker Carlson have a right to interview Putin? Uh, nobody can deny that and shouldn't deny that. And the second is that how much do we actually give them space ourselves? So this is what a uh, colleague already mentioned. So there are certain uh, limits that we should not uh, uh, exceed because what if you look in the basis of sanctions of these uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, propaganda uh, publications, and this is the basis which exists, and how they were used uh, in uh, uh, Russian war against Ukraine. So this was not free and independent media, but these were tools in the hands of the uh, military machinery. And we see that how uh, Putin, he, his speeches also exceeds a certain. Uh, uh, limits. Well, yes, it's all the borders he exceeds. For worldwide politics, worldwide press, it's very important to stop to make citation. Just start to make analyze. It could be much more easy immediately. Well, we'll see that this, that is a developing story today. Professor Ani Maggi, do you want to join us with your thoughts on that? Right, so may, maybe just two, two quick things. I mean, uh, sure. I, think, I think what's been said is, is correct in terms of it's impossible to shut down a president of Russia completely, obviously. I mean, that's, that's, that's a sort of, um, uh, that's, that's, that's out of the question. And I think the other, uh, the, the, the issue with, with the interview and uh, in, in some ways um, the whole narrative that's, that's come out from, from Russia about the war in Ukraine, which, in a, a simple fact, is one country invaded another, right? That's, that's what happened, and it's been going on now almost two years. Uh, and it came in the heels of, 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 of con years of, of, of tension and, and so forth. 
So it's an invasion. So that's, that's an uh, undisputable fact. But there is the other narrative, uh, which, which sadly has a lot of ad adherence, a lot of support, a lot of uh, sympathy, uh, outside of Ukraine mostly, uh, but in the United States and elsewhere, which is that in a sense this somehow was a uh, preemptive move on the part of Russia because it was concerned about security because of NATO enlargement. And sadly, that's something that will never, ever, you cannot, that debate and those views are impossible to shut down. Because they're broadly shared, broadly disputed. Uh, I, won't, I don't agree with that, but, but it is something that, that whether or not there is a Russian disinformation campaign or not, is likely to continue and be, be out there. Uh, and that's, I think, something that, that we have to keep in mind, that, that there, yes, uh, there are facts that, if, if there are, there's misinformation uh, in terms of, of uh, factual problems and so forth, that obviously needs to be pointed out, whether it's on X or through, through, through some kind of a watchdog, uh, European watchdog or, or something, something like that. That's something that needs to be clearly pointed out, any factual mistake, uh, um, <clears throat> any lies, in, in other words. But unfortunately, there's that whole gray area of interpretation. Thank you. Of views, views, sure. and so forth. And we, we cannot control that. Yes, and we all try to find some info bits that are important for us in this interview. Putin was asked if he plans to attack Baltic states or neighboring states. He said no, no plans for Latvia, Poland, or others. So we heard the same words before Ukrainian war. But let's move back to Estonian. Next topic. The media loves uh, high-flying titles. New York Times recently wrote that this year in the world uh, we will see the biggest uh, um, uh, conflict uh, between disinformation and uh, elections. And uh, when we add disinformation to the campaigns that are taking place, then the situation is uh, quite complicated and explosive. So so this year, are we witnessing uh, the biggest uh, uh, sort of uh, opposition in history? I don't believe that. It sounds uh, very dramatic. I think this political struggle has always been there. I don't think that this era is all that special or different. I think that uh, during the economic crisis in the 20s in Europe and the world, the situation was as bad, and I think that uh, we should uh, be uh, quite relaxed about it. between democracy and disinformation this year during those elections. Yeah, I think uh, it's much more populism, it's much more successful uh, disinformation, deepfake, etc. Yeah, because they play with emotion. And um, maybe for all uh, opinion leaders and uh, civil activists, very important to make this explanation how we make choice between emotion and real calculation of successful from politics. Yeah, that's why it's does not work in some countries, especially in Ukraine. We have another situation before war with election, also with Trump and USA. Yeah, it's much more good to emotion, to populism, but uh, I'm still sure that world <laughs> and uh, people have much more better future. When we, we, we have to understand how to, it works and start to use it for profit, not for disappointed. Uh. Counterintuitively, I, I would agree with my co-panelists. Um, I think elections are useful in that it's a rallying point to intensify the efforts and concentrate the attention of also the, um, uh, the, the governments and, and, and civil society around the risks. But I think we all know in this room that it's not only about the elections. I mean, it's a whole ecosystem of, of the information. Uh, disorders, but it's objectively helping in that it concentrates the efforts on everything we, we spoke about on this panel, uh, not least uh, the technology and generative AI. I think uh, the use of, um, of deep fakes in Slovak elections was something that uh, really brought 
a lot of attention. Uh, we just agreed um, on the AI Act in the EU, which addresses the risks of AI. So it doesn't regulate the technology in principle, but regulates the risk of the use cases. And one of the use cases that is really dangerous or risky for democracy as such is uh, deep fakes uh, in elections. So we're now talking to platforms um, uh, to have a system of some sort of labeling or watermarking of generative AI and this agreement with the companies came very, very fast and maybe without this election superior, uh, it would have taken more, more time. But in principle, it's, it's uh, as difficult a year as uh, any other year. As any other. Tim. Um, Again, two thoughts. First of all, it is a risk because the elections are the main event of democracy in, from several aspects and we need to be ready for it. And I think we are much better prepared than we were in 2016, for example, when intervening in the elections. Uh, well, this was a topic uh, that many more people became aware of, uh, uh, organized by uh, the um, uh, Russian Federation in the US. And eight years later, we have a number of steps that were taken in the EU. Uh, we have the rapid alert system. As the 27 member states have a network where the experts on government level meet regularly and exchange information on these very topics. Uh, we have uh, trained our colleagues and so on, so a lot has been done in uh, the meantime. Second reason why I uh, think uh, uh, that these over-exaggerated uh, headlines uh, will not be realized is due to the fact that in parallel we uh, have a number of elections going on. When we focus on Russia, then we need to presume that they have a huge capacity in addition to the current war in Ukraine and everything else to intervene in dozens of elections across the globe. We shouldn't give them that much credit. I don't think they have that capacity. Secondly, uh, Russian propaganda doesn't work in this way that uh, one information uh, operation, one piece of uh, disinformation affects uh, the opinions of tens of thousands of people and uh, then uh, becomes a ch certain choice on election day. No, it's more like drop by drop. Uh, it's boring a hole in the stone. It takes time. And uh, secondly, uh, these uh, um, high-flying media titles uh, work against us because it's like a perception hacking uh, that uh, the adversary creates a situation where we lose confidence. When we look at uh, what Prigozhin claimed during uh, US elections 2018-2020, that uh, no US citizen should sleep soundly at night because he will decide what the outcome will be, which is absurd. Uh, but it's just an example of this perception hacking. The idea is to make people feel that there's no point in, in uh, voting because someone in Russia is going to decide who our president will be anyway, which isn't the case at all. So this year definitely is a year to follow the American development. So your thoughts on that? Is it the year of perfect storm between the clash of, of disinformation and elections? I mean, short answers, yes. Let me just, just very quickly point out that there's another election this Sunday in a country very close to where you are now. Uh, that is probably one of the most boring presidential elections Finland has ever had, which means that nobody... How much can... disinformation is there around? And, and this, uh, really, the, the, the differences are, are, are so minor, so maybe that is the real piece of disinformation in that election, that, that the two candidates have very, very, very limited disagreements about issues of substance. But in terms, <laughs> in terms of the United States, um, I, I think I would, I would probably say that yes, this, uh, this disinformation, all of this will play a major role. There will be lots of fake news and, and, and all the rest of it. But ultimately, um, it is not a, um, 
hugely different from some of the other American elections uh, that, that have taken place in the sense that the American political system thrives on, uh, on conflict. Uh, on, on sort of, because you have the two major parties, you always end up on a, in a battle between two personalities um, that, are, that are widely different. What is different now in, in many ways, what, what the perfect storm is, uh, is, is all about is that we have these, all these legal cases, uh, we have all these ac accusations about abuse of power, about incitement of, of, of violence, of, of insurrection, on one candidate, and the other side is trying to come back with similar arguments about uh, about the, the sitting president, which are not really sticking uh, at the moment. So th there's going to be it's going to be very very nasty. There's no no question about that. Whether it's nastier than ever before is of course then very difficult to to measure. Um, that um, you know, we always think that, that whatever is happening now is the most important and something that never ever happened in the history of the world before. But of course, we also know that there is continuity, there is similarity. We can compare this with, with some of the other uh, nastiness. Perhaps the 2016 election, for example, or the 2020 election in the United States, both had very, very nasty, uh, nasty features as well. So, so on that scale, uh, I don't think, you know, we will feel it's, it's worse, but maybe if we could go back and, and relive 2016 or 2020, we might actually see that, oh, well, it's same old, same old. Thank you. Kiire küsimus, Arnold. A quick question, Arnold. Uh, with disinformation, uh, can you uh, fight disinformation on uh, state level in public institutions uh, so there wouldn't be the perception uh, that uh, it is censorship? Well, yes, uh, Sergei Seretenko, for example, is an example uh, where we had a case in Supreme Court uh, and a uh, decision was enforced where we had a traditional disinformation creation, uh, independent uh, human rights experts according to Moscow guidelines, went to OECD uh, session, spoke about horrific situation of human rights in Estonia, and this was quoted later. So this has been revised by the court. The evidence has been weighed. So of course, in such situations, uh, public institutions must interfere. Uh, last five minutes, a question to everybody. This information uh, hasn't it been uh, just blown out of proportion? Maybe we should just uh, understand that, that, that there are useful idiots, but most of us uh, rely on common sense and we will see through disinformation wars. Let's start with you. Well, thank you. Yes, it's an important topic. We cannot negate it, but there are two sides to it. Who is covering a specific topic area um, must uh, sense their responsibility. Since we spoke about elections, it's also about the fact that Estonian people overall are very uh, modest and uh, um, allow politicians to stay in their comfort zone. Civic society should ask real questions from politicians and uh, not have politicians sell uh, foolishness to them. Uh, so with death, disinformation as well, do you need to respond to all these stupid statements or should you turn to the media? I read that. Uh, take it down. People need to be more active. That can change the situation. If we have war, we will use this information too. <laughs> and uh, I don't think that it will be disappeared uh, for many years in future. On the other hand, if we will make destroying centers of disinformation, for example, uh, Russia have to disappear or reorganized in future, it means that it will be less. And maybe just uh, useful idiots will <laughs> take care about this matter because life will be, be missing without. Uh, but I'm sure that when, um, when people uh, will come to media, grammar and critical science of mind, uh, it will be finished with emotional, uh, emotional using of information. We have to make jump and to start to, to have information eaten without garbage. Yeah, it's very important. Daniel, you're short. 
thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, very short. Uh, I, I love how we always say the useful when talking about useful, useful mm -hmm. idiots. But, um, three, three points. Uh, one, and I will repeat myself a little bit. Uh, it's obvious we can't do it from Brussels only, we can't do it from Tallinn only. We need researchers, we need platforms, we need experts. It's not only verifiability of facts, but also contextualization, distorting the information space, and this requires different policy and other and communication instruments. Second point, um, we cannot, and I'm making for you a very nice bridge to the next panel, we, we cannot only focus on dampening the voice of disinformation and manipulation, but also supporting the authoritative sources to fill the information space with facts. So here we are talking about media. So great that the next panel follows. And my third point would be, um, I think the big lesson from, from the past years is that there is no magic solution. We can kill X, but we won't solve the problem. It will require a lot of simultaneous actions taken together. Maybe some of them are less effective, more effective. They will evolve in time, just like this information will. But the worst thing would be just to get paralyzed by discussing forever, oh, but this is not so uh, effective. So. Thank you. Enne kui ma annan siim sulle sõna, teie generatsioon peab selle kogu jamaga tegelema. Before I pass the floor to you, see, your generation will have to tackle this uh, topic area more seriously. You have many years ahead of you. Uh, Professor Anhimagi. Is there a overreaction about this disinformation thing or should we just use our common sense? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's how you define common sense, of course, which <laughs> is, is, is difficult. I think maybe the one, one comment I, I would make, would say that it's, uh, it's very general, of course, but I think if, if you want to have democracies, it's virtually impossible to control information. Uh, and, and, so, and, and it would be counterproductive, I think, in terms of, of, of a democratic political system to, to try to do that. And because the, I think the normal instinct, anytime you, and, and I'm very impressed by what the European Union is doing and all, all the rest of it in, in, in creating a, a kind of a watchdog. But when you create a watchdog on anything, the question that immediately will be asked, well, who's watching the watchdog? And, and that, of course, creates this, uh, this sort of cycle of, of, of questions and potential of conspiracy theories that then will create yet another cycle of misinformation. So don't expect there to be a paradise of, of, of just uh, agreement. And, and I don't think it would be a paradise of, of agreement on what is a fact and, and, and what is not. Um, but I still am optimistic in thinking that since most people, the majority of people are reasonable, the majority of people will never again believe that the earth is flat as I said in the beginning. So uh, it will remain a small minority that, that will be taken by conspiracy theories, misinformation, and, and so forth. But we cannot kill it. I think that's, that's, that's the starting point. Thank you very much. Siim, keeruline maail meie sinu nägemus. Siim, this complicated world that we're facing, what is your take on it? If the question is whether on a national level we should tackle all kinds of, of disinformation examples, probably no, because there's too much of all it and we need to learn to live amongst lies as well and falsehood, because as the president and minister said at the beginning of the day, uh, lies are part of our essence, whether we like it or not, they've been with us uh, since the beginning of humanity. If the question is whether on a national level, on a state level, we should uh, tackle a situation where other countries and regime, um, Russia, China, are using information as a tool or, or even a weapon, then the answer is clearly yes. On the one hand, we have a moral obligation, despite the fact that we sincerely uh, think uh, that uh, whatever we do against uh, Russian subversion, uh, they will continue with it. We still have the moral obligation. 
to do what we can and what is reasonable to protect our citizens and defend our citizens. And the second reason I think that we need to deal with these issues on a state level is who else can lead it. It's not just the state's um, obligation. The only key to success is cooperation between uh, private public sector and uh, civic society and the EU. And of course, uh, between cooperation between uh, countries as well. And the reason we, this is an asymmetric uh, fight. People can maybe make the difference between truth and falsehood, but when technology has reached the level where it just takes minutes to create a professional uh, misinformation video, then uh, people will not always be able to tell the difference between what is fabricated and what is not. And we need to defend people and give them the tools to do so. Thank you. This is the end of our first panel. Thank you to the panelists. Ten-minute break, and then the next uh, panel will continue.